How the Internet Was Invented The Internet evolved from a military communication network into a massive worldwide cyberspace in 40 years. And it all began at Beer Garden in California. In the land of unicorns and apps, Wasadis is unique. Situated in the center of Silicon Valley, this beer garden has stood in the same location since 1852. It doesn't scale and isn't disruptive. However, it has served one purpose admirably for more than 150 years. It has provided Californians with a haven for intoxication. Wasadis has had a lengthy history as a frontier bar, a gold rush gambling house, and a rendezvous for Hell's Angels. The customers are still as diverse as ever, and it is now known as the Alpine Inn Beer Garden. There are leather-clad bikers and riders in spandex on the terrace out back. A man with wild hair who could be a CEO, a madman, or a professor is writing in a notebook. There's a Maserati, a Harley, and a horse in the parking lot. The internet operates in the exact opposite way. Though we only get to see flashes of it, it's everywhere. Similar to a Holy Spirit, the internet appears to us as websites, apps, and emails by taking over the pixels on our screens. But its true nature is always somewhere else. Because of this property, the internet appears to be quite complex. It must take a high level of technical skill to comprehend something that is both so common and invisible. However, it doesn't. The internet is essentially easy to use, and the secret to its success lies in its simplicity. The global community produced the internet's founders. They worked for a variety of organizations, including Xerox, the University of Hawaii, the National Physical Laboratory in England, and the French government-sponsored computer network Cyclades. The hub was the heavily funded research division of the U.S. Defense Department, the Advanced Research Projects Agency ARPA, which subsequently became the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency DARPA, along with a large number of its contractors. The Internet wouldn't exist without ARPA. ARPA's creation of the Internet served a specific military purpose since it provided a means of deploying computation to the front lines. ARPA constructed the ARPANET computer network in 1969, which connected mainframes at educational institutions, governmental organizations, and defense contractors across the nation. With its rapid growth, ARPANET had around 60 nodes by the middle of the 1970s. However, ARPANET had a flaw in that it was immobile. By today's standards, the ARPANET computers were enormous, and they interacted with one another via fixed lines. That might be useful for researchers who could work from a Mendel Park or Cambridge terminal, but it was of little use to soldiers stationed far into enemy territory. ARPANET needed to be available everywhere in the world to be helpful to forces operating in the field. Imagine yourself in a jeep in the Zarian forests or 52 miles over North Vietnam. Then picture these as nodes connected to a different network of potent computers situated hundreds of miles away via a wireless connection. The idea is to use computer power to defeat the Soviet Union and its allies through a networked military. The internet was born out of this dream. It was two steps to making this goal come true. First, a wireless network had to be constructed so that data packets could be radially or satellite set between the variously located parts of the U.S. military apparatus. The other involved tying those wireless networks onto ARPANET's conventional network so that soldiers could use multi-million dollar mainframes while they were engaged in combat. The scientists dubbed it internetworking. Transferring data between networks was like trying to write a Mandarin letter to a Hungarian recipient. The internet was created to address the issue of internetworking. It posed many difficulties. Networking or getting computers to communicate with one another had proven to be challenging enough. However, establishing communication between networks or internetworking presented an entirely new set of challenges due to the network's strange and incomprehensible dialects. Transferring data between them was like trying to communicate with someone who only spoke Hungarian by writing a letter in Mandarin. It was unsuccessful. In response, the creators of the internet created a universal language that allowed data to flow over any network, akin to a digital version of Esperanto. An early blueprint was published in 1974 by Robert Kahn and Vint Cerf, two researchers at ARPA. Based on discussions occurring across the global networking community, they drew up a plan for a simple but very flexible protocol, a common set of guidelines for computer-to-computer -computer communication. These regulations needed to achieve an extremely fine balance. On the one hand, they had to be stringent enough to guarantee dependable data transfer. Conversely, they had to be sufficiently flexible to support every possible mode of data transmission. Sir says to me, it had to be future-proof. The protocol could not be written for a single moment in time since it would quickly become outdated. The armed forces would continue to develop. They would never stop developing new technologies and networks. The protocol needed to adapt to an arbitrarily large number of distinct and potentially non-interoperable packet-switched networks including ones that were still in the future, according to Surf. The system would become potentially unlimited as well as future-proof with this functionality. 
The ensemble of networks could expand endlessly, absorbing any digital forms into its vast, multi-threaded mesh if the laws were strong enough. These guidelines eventually became the Internet's common language. But first they had to be put into practice, adjusted, and tested numerous times over. The development of the Internet was not inescapable. Even among those building it, many thought it was a ridiculous notion. The Internet was a skyscraper and no one had ever seen anything taller than a few stories. That was the scale. That was the ambition. The Internet appeared to be a long shot, even with the financial firehose of Cold War military funding behind it. Then it began to function in the summer of 1976. On August 27, 1976, if you had entered Rossati's beer garden, you would have seen seven men and one woman seated at a table, the woman typing as they hovered over a computer terminal. Two cables vanished into a large gray van and ran from the terminal to the parking lot. There were devices inside the van that converted the words being typed on the terminal into data packets. These packets were then broadcast as radio signals by an antenna mounted on the van's roof. These signals traveled over the atmosphere to a neighboring mountaintop repeater, where they were amplified and retransmitted. They were able to reach Menlo Park with the additional boost, where they were picked up by an antenna at an office building. The true magic started to happen at this point. Incoming packets moved smoothly between networks inside the office building from ARPANET to the packet radio network. The packets had to change somewhat to achieve this leap. Without altering their content, they were forced to adapt their shape. Consider water. Its chemical makeup doesn't change whether it is a liquid, vapor, or ice. The natural universe is blessed with this amazing flexibility since life depends on it. On the other hand, the Internet's adaptability has to be engineered. And on that August day, it made it possible for packets that had just been radio signals on a wireless network to change into electrical impulses in ARPANET's wired network. Amazingly, the data was perfectly maintained by this processing. The packs held together perfectly, so undamaged that they could be combined into the identical message that was entered into the terminal at Rossati's and transported 3,000 kilometers more to a computer in Boston. This internetwork journey was propelled by the new protocol developed by Khan and Surf. One network had split into two, the internet function. Don Nielsen informs me, there weren't balloons or anything like that. In his 80s, Nielsen oversaw the experiment at Rossati's for the ARPA contractor Stanford Research Institute SRI. He is tall, soft-spoken, and unrelentingly modest, rarely has someone had a better justification for boasting and less of a desire to do so. Sitting in his Palo Alto home's living room, four miles from Google and nine from Facebook, he never even acknowledges that he invented the technology that enabled these opulently profitable companies. Another legacy of Don Nielsen and his fellow scientists is the idea that the internet is a separate universe that we might be in or on. Through their seamless integration of disparate networks, they created the illusion of a unified internet. This is, strictly speaking, a delusion. The internet is made up of a huge number of networks. For example, my data has to pass through 11 separate routers to reach Google's website. However, the internet is a skilled weaver. It hides its seams remarkably effectively. What's left is the impression of an infinite transnational digital world, or what we used to call cyberspace. This world began to expand 40 years ago when it first flared into existence in the foothills outside of Palo Alto. Enjoyed the video? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. Your support means a lot and helps us bring you more great content. Thanks for watching.